Hey everybody, Christy Rice here. This is part two from last week's video. I will link to part one in the descriptions for you. Um, today we're actually going to be painting into the pattern that I showed you how to sketch in the last video. This is just a super quick uh, look at the entire process. Don't worry, I am going to slow this down and talk through the entire process for you. But I did want you to get a good, quick overview of the entire uh, painting process at a glance, because I think it's important for you to see it that way, just as much as it's important for you to see in real time. Uh, so that's what you're looking at here. This is a very loose sketch, as you may remember, and uh, the painting style as well. I'm trying to hold myself back here, keeping it very loose, very washy, very much uh, instinctive and expressive and not getting too heavy with detail. Um, so soon here, we're going to slow things down, start over. We're gonna pick up exactly where we left off last week and start to talk about adding watercolor to this sketch. All right, here we go. So I started very simply uh, by adding fairly clean water, <laughs> not completely clean as you can see, but fairly clean water to the page. And remember guys, this is now in real time. Just wanted you to have a peek at that, um, that kind of time lapse earlier. Uh, so clean water. This is a great technique uh, to use. Again, this is called wet and wet. I've talked about it a lot. Uh, if you want to get that real juicy kind of out of control look with your watercolor, and I do want to have some of that in this composition, so I've now dropped wet color into wet, clean water on the page. Now, watch my brush. I'm taking very calculated time in between brush strokes to kind of choose my areas carefully. I'm not painting like I'm in a coloring book. And what I mean by that very simply is that I'm not painting and filling in all the shapes perfectly. I'm using some color in some areas, lighter color in others, and really just being very particular about how I'm laying down my color. Now, speaking of color, I want you to have a look at the palette that I'm using today. This is the Schmenka. 48 half pan set and I'm not showing this to you so that you feel like you must use the exact paints that I am in fact I really don't necessarily want you to as a beginner I'm showing you this palette so you can see the general colors that I'll be using throughout this demo that way you can go ahead look at your resources what palettes you have and make educated decisions and estimates as to what colors are going to most closely match those that i'm using so again i'm showing you this not to make you feel like you have to go out and you know spend over a hundred dollars on this palette because you absolutely do not and should not at this stage unless you really really want to uh, i'm showing you this because i want you to just get a general idea of the colors i'm using so to start i'm using a bright pink again i'm not going to call these by their actual names because i don't want you to get tangled up in that idea i'm using kind of a light purple um, just notice the circles on the screen. I'm actually circling the colors I'm using. A yellow, a grassy green, and a medium orange. So I know some of you might be using Winsor & Newton. You'll find some great equivalents there. Others may be using Artist Loft palette from Michaels. That's a popular one for beginners. Um, all you need to do really is just stop for a moment, pause the screen, and take a look at the palette you have and see what colors on your palette best match the ones that I'm showing you here. Just follow along with the circles and take a look. Now, if you don't wanna follow my color palette, by all means, don't feel like you need to, uh, but I know there's a lot of you out there just based on some comments I've received, uh, some emails that really like to get a good sense of the colors I'm using. And so guys, this one is especially for you. So hopefully you enjoy having a peek at the specific colors I've used in this painting. And you'll notice it's quite the limited palette. It's 
five colors. Uh, so we can really make some magic happen with very few colors and I'm really excited to show you the rest of that. Continuing on here, uh, I do have that wet and wet area, the pink, I used a little bit of that light purple. Uh, remember now you can mix colors, so if you mix your pink, Remember, I used five colors here. If you mix the pink or the purple with a little bit of your green, you're gonna get that darker purple that you see there in that main peony um, at the left-hand side, adding a little bit of yellow. And guys, one thing I wanna bring up, please don't be afraid. And this is not something I've talked about a lot on this channel, um, but I will continue to because I'm passionate about it. Don't be afraid to uh, let one watercolor area touch another when they're both wet and what I mean by that is let your colors bleed together now you don't want to get crazy with it because obviously if you let all your colors bleed together all the time you're just gonna have a big muddy mess but you saw that moment there where I was painting in the yellow center of this beautiful side angle peony and I just touched another area with it and the yellow bled right into the pink I didn't panic I didn't worry about it because it was a controlled bleed and it really actually added a nice something to the look. So think about that when you're painting next time. Um, I'm going in with a more intense pink here. Mixing that bright pink and your purple together is gonna give you more of a burgundy, play around with that. If you feel like you wanna add colors, don't feel limited to my five color palette. By all means, bring in an indigo or whatever it is that you're feeling like you wanna add. Don't also be afraid about actually adding some color to areas that um, are not penciled in like I did there at the very top just now. Um, because really, uh, look at your photograph and remember from last week's video, and you can find that in the descriptions below, I'll link to that. In last week's video, we were working from a photograph and I will pop that up on the screen again. Don't be afraid to continually refer back to that. Uh, it can be a source of comfort during your painting times. Um, some people are purists and um, idealists and they don't like to work from photographs. They like to work from their imagination. I love to work from photographs. So um, keep that photo handy. I suggested last time to take a screenshot of your paused screen and print it out. And I would say to do that again if you haven't already. And so I love that little green bit right in the middle and I added that in without it being pencil sketched in and you'll see later on I'm going to do some more of that and I think that's a really nice contrast to have in your painting to have some sketched bits with pencil show through and for some to not be sketched in um, just really breaks up the painting and makes it more visually interesting. All right, I'm going in with um, the pink that I've mixed with the green. It's turned into a rusty red. Uh, just adding some more wet areas. I had a couple droplets there. When you see those happen, don't panic. Um, it happens to me all the time, just blot them up. Um, there may be times where you drop paint onto your paper that will not lift out. Um, and in those moments, you either sketch in some more flowers or add some very purposeful spatter onto the top of it and you're all good. Um, so I'm just continuing through here. This technique right here is a wet on dry, which means I'm taking wet color and just adding it to the dry page. So this is a more controlled way of applying paint to the paper. Um, it doesn't give you that bleeding. Uh, it keeps the color where you lay it down. So this is also something really nice to contrast uh, with your wet and wet. The wet and wet is softer when it dries. The look can be more expressive because everything's bleeding together. Whereas the wet on dry, and again, I'm doing that here with this orange ranunculus, um, is quite a bit more controlled. Uh, going back to that concept of just really being mindful of your brush strokes that you're laying down, uh, this style of painting is still very mindful. And what I mean by that is just because a watercolor painting of this style is in the end very loose, I call it loosey-goosey, um, it's very loose and sometimes feels very wild, it doesn't mean that you haven't made 
calculated decisions. So still be thinking about, if you've watched my other videos here on this channel, think back to the video where we did the watercolor exercises in terms of how to best get the most out of your brushes. So think about the thick and thin, more pressure, less pressure on your brush. All of those little details and how you hold your brush, the angle at which your hand is laying, all of the those things should and can still come into play when you're working on a very, very expressive painting. So um, don't lose sight of those type of techniques and approaches because they really can help you uh, maintain an expressive and free-spirited painting without it getting terribly muddy or messy. I'm going through here and adding more greens. Remember your color wheel, opposites on the color wheel. Maybe I'll pop a little color wheel up on here for you to see. If you mix opposite colors on the wheel, you will get darker, less saturated versions of those colors. So for example, if you mix yellow with a purple, you're gonna get a muddier purple or a darker yellow. So how do you mix mustard, for example? You mix a little bit of purple with your yellow. Same goes for red and green, blue and orange, and all of the secondary and tertiary colors in between. Um, so if you guys would like to take a screenshot of my color wheel here, you may recognize this from Painterly Days, the inside flaps of the books. By all means, take a screenshot to remember a little bit of your color theory from today. I uh, hope you enjoyed that. So let's get back to the painting here. Just continuing on with some of the orange wet on dry, uh, being calculated about my brush stroke placement. Notice I am, I've been only using one brush. This is the Princeton brush uh, Neptune series, and I believe it's a number eight and I will list sources below for you. This is just a simple round brush, keeps a beautiful point, and it's just super versatile. So I like to keep it simple, as you know, uh, with a lot of my painting styles. See how I use the brush there? I'm almost perpendicular to the page with my brush. That allows me to take advantage of the point really nicely. Uh, and then I can also get really beautiful broad strokes as well. Going almost perpendicular again, to add some detail to the inside of this beautiful ruffly burgundy peony. And with this, uh, and now see, I actually think I used a sixth color here. Yes, <laughs> I did. I used an indigo. So guys, I lied with my previous slides. Um, by all means, feel free to add in an indigo there to get really dark tones. You could even mix a little black with any of the colors that I talked about earlier. Um, you could even mix a little black. So now you guys know my secret, huh? Um, you know that um, a lot of the editing that I do and the voiceovers are often done after the painting is done. So boom, you know my secret. Oh well, what are you gonna do? So um, yes, five colors plus maybe a black or an indigo, totally up to you. Use your black or your indigo to really get some dark darks. All right, so just continuing on here, um, adding, I'm really struggling with that flower up there in the right upper um, right hand corner. Um, it just, I don't like the angle. I tried to make it really cool and, and, and super simplified in its shape, but I'm not loving it. So um, we'll figure out how to address that a little bit later. Uh, you've seen me add a ton of green here recently, especially along the right hand side. I'm gonna go back in here and play with this a little bit. Uh, but getting back to my comment about the green, the greens that I was adding is the first layer here. Grass green mixed with a lot of red and then watered down tremendously. Um, so that gives you a really beautiful, versatile sage green. Um, if you want to hear me say that again, just rewind and replay um, because it's a really good point to make if you're looking for that perfect sage green. I've gone in with a really that really bright magenta and added a touch of that there. I'm using now a little bit more opaque color, which means I don't have as much water on my brush. And so that will give you much stronger color, a lot more coverage, things won't be as sheer. Uh, that is actually something I've been playing a lot with in my own personal work lately is really juxtaposing very sheer watercolor with very, very intense, almost opaque watercolor. Anyway, that's a topic for a, another demo. 
So I definitely felt like this area here at the bottom right hand corner needed something. This is not a flower that's in the inspiration image. Uh, so don't panic, it's okay. This is something I'm making up. If you feel the need and you want to make something up, I just thought that a side view flower would be fantastic. I just kind of made something up from my head. But by all means, if you don't feel comfortable doing that, just Google a side view peony and you will absolutely find a ton of reference images uh, that you can use to add a little something extra. And I'm just using that um, bright pink watered down a bit for the body of the flower, a little bit of the purple darkened up a bit um, for the interior. I'm kind of mimicking that um, main peony that I first painted here um, in terms of color, color palette. Now see what I did there? I added a little bit of yellow because I wanted it to look a little sun-kissed, just jazz it up a bit, um, and it got a little bit out of control. So I added some clean water on top and blotted it back to remove some of that yellow. Going in here with a burgundy that I've created from the bright pink mixed with a little tiny bit of green, um, and I'm gonna let that dry a bit. Let's talk about that drying piece of this whole process while I'm adding some highlights of yellow here for a sun-kissed look. Something that can happen very easily and quickly, I'm gonna slow down the video here so you can still see what I'm doing. I'm adding in some yellow areas that are not penciled in first for accent, so I want you to watch that as I'm chatting about drying time. Don't get into a position where you have got your whole page so wet but you just feel like you're really into it and you just want to finish the painting so you keep going because what's going to happen things are going to get completely messy things are going to start bleeding together in not the not pretty ways but in the the muddy messy ways and in the end you're going to feel really frustrated and you're going to feel like the painting's a struggle so a couple of things you can do you can work on opposite ends of the painting as you go so that while you're working on one side, the other side is drying. You can add a hair dryer to your painting table, your painting area, so that you can expedite the drying process. Um, or you can just do it the old fashioned way, have a couple of paintings going at one time. When your painting gets too wet, put it aside and um, pick it back up when it's dried and in the meantime work on another painting. Um, I'm a big fan of the hair dryer, to be honest. It's not glamorous, but man, does it work. So um, just a little tip there for you on drying. You'll be so much happier um, that you took the time and you had the patience to let areas dry before you go back into them. Because when you do wanna get a little bit of that extra definition, the only thing that's gonna give it to you is for the under part of your painting, the most recent area that you painted for it to be dry. You need it to be dry if you wanna go back in and add some dimension and contrast and detail. All right. Continuing on here, and this is the point in a painting where you really need to step back and have a look and say to yourself, is there enough detail? Do I feel like it's convincing enough? Do I feel like I'm on the edge of it maybe being too much? And really, I'm looking at it here and I feel the need, although I do wanna kind of reserve myself, I do feel the need to add some detail. So I've taken a big step here to add some spatter. Um, and this is a bold spatter. Again, this is that bright pink mixed with a little bit of green. So it's like a rusty spatter, um, but I actually really love it. But again, I still, I'm in this kind of evaluation stage. This is a quick painting, but I don't want to overwork it. But I am going to go back in with my indigo. As I confessed, I did add a sixth color. Um, <laughs> you can either use indigo or black. And I'm adding in some really, really intense areas because I feel like this painting needed that. Whereas if I hadn't added in those really strong details with my brush, I feel like my eye was kind of all over the place. Like my eye didn't know where to go. And that is a little bit more of an adv advanced concept, but something that you do want to think about. When you're trying to determine whether or not a painting is finished, you have to ask yourself, what is the focal point? 
And from the get-go, I think I've made it pretty clear that I thought that that peony right there, kind of on the left side um, towards the middle, was my focal point. And so when I, I stopped just about a minute bef before now and looked, I felt like my eye wasn't going there. So, so very simply, the reason I added the darker color where I did that indigo is just so that my eye would know where to go and that the viewer's eye, other than mine, staring at this painting at some point, would know where to go. And it would just make for a very visually pleasing effect. You know, there's a real science behind what makes this painting draw you in more than that painting and I could go on and on and have plentiful topics for other YouTube demos and I certainly will talk about this more in the future um, but this is just to give you a little taste of composition um, and how some of these decisions are made when I'm painting um, and how you can use the idea of a focal point and and drawing the eye in for your own painting so thank you so much guys I've really enjoyed this one can't wait to hear your comments until next time